there is an atmosphere here that I don't often see, certainly in business gatherings. I mean, right. I go to some gatherings, maybe you do, where people are a little bit jaded and it's been around the There's an enthusiasm and a passion here that I don't see every day. You know, I will tell you, I'll be honest, I don't see it every day. I don't see it any day. Uh, it's absolutely terrific. We brought back 2,300 small business graduates who came here on their own steam and they paid their way to come here to um, listen to speakers, talk to each other, have breakout groups, learn business, and but the most important thing, to network with each other and to make a declaration of uh, how enthusiastic they are to be small businessmen and women in the United States. It's absolutely terrific. So why did you do this originally? I mean, you, didn't you make a commitment of like $500 million? Yeah, we did. We did. Um, I will tell you, there's a number of brain reasons and a heart reason hmm. for doing it. On the first, in the first place, you know, business, and, and it's an old saw at this point, it's a kind of a cliche, small business is the backbone of the USA, hires more than half the people in the United States. I could tell you, but I think everybody knows that the success of Goldman Sachs and all of its businesses correlates with GDP, and if you want to drive GDP in this country, you have to make things easier and better for small business people and have them grow, and then the economy grows and we grow with it. That's the kind of rationale you, you'll hear. But also, I'll tell you, on an emotional level, you know, anybody who's in any kind of industry at all wants to, of course, wants to make a good living for himself or herself, but you also have to have an ethic and a belief that what you do is important, uh, is valuable, accomplishes something. If you go into pharmaceuticals, maybe you want to make a living, but you also have to care about discovering drugs or being part of a process that helps cure people. In construction, you have to want to build things, you know, et cetera. If you're in finance like we are and you commit your life to it, you have to have a core belief in the value and the efficiency and the effectiveness of the capitalist system. Them. People work, they're incented, they try to make a profit, not so much because they want to win everything, but because they want to make enough money so that it's self-sustaining as opposed to a philanthropy where you have to keep asking people for help. And it's a great system that allows people go out, they make a product people want, they hire people, those people get paid, they go out and buy more products, and more people can manufacture stuff to give it to them, and it's a wonderful cycle in the country. In some ways, we get to do that at Goldman Sachs on a very large scale. That's the good side. The bad side is the scale is so large, it's not a human scale, it's a wholesale scale. And you don't really get to see that operating on a human level. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to show the effectiveness of what we do by investing in small businessmen, real people. So we've invested in their education, programs that help them, things that give them confidence, explain to them how to make a business plan, how to, um, how to negotiate, how to ask for financing, et cetera, et cetera. We married them up with financing in some cases. In almost every case, we, had, we married them up with an advisor from Goldman Sachs who normally works on a great big scale but is actually telling somebody and helping somebody decide whether they should buy a new refrigerator for their catering business. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, it's the backbone of the economy, and that's generally accepted to be true, whether it's job growth or the, the dynamism in the economy. At the same time, the rate of origination of new businesses is going down in this country. There's a long-term decline in how many new businesses are being created. What's wrong? That says something about the economy that doesn't sound very encouraging. Well, I think um, that is a problem. And I think people have noticed that and people are trying to address it. Uh, you know, part of this is trying to help, you know, us teaching small business people. The small business people have responded in teaching us. Mm -hmm. And they've complained about several things and we're trying to gather that together and feel how to address it. One of the things they've talked about is red tape, difficulties in starting a business. And red tape is another name for regulation, so in some respects it's a similar problem to the one that large businesses have, uh, obtaining financing. Uh, and um, also getting qualified people to work in their business, you know, the educational system. These are all things. Red tape has been increasing. Financing has been hard to, uh, uh, to come by. These are all things that over the period of time you're talking about have gotten a little bit worse and worse in this country. Regulation has gotten a little bit worse and made it very much harder to start a business. Uh, and I think that we feel it in our business, but it's interesting to hear that they feel it in their, their business. Now, these are people who have overcome that, but for every person who's overcome that, there's probably a wannabe who probably got caught up either in the red tape, the failure to get financing, or the possibility or the difficulty of finding qualified people. 
So as we sit here in Washington, uh, we really have to think about the extent to which Washington is affecting that environment for small business as well as big business. And a couple of things you just mentioned. On the one hand, on red tape regulation, the Trump administration has made a priority of reducing regulation. That should be, uh, over time, good for small business. On the other hand, the cost of capital, getting those loans at an affordable interest rate, we're really right now beginning to become a bit concerned about, given the level of deficit spending, the level of borrowing. Is that a real cause for concern, the possibility of an increase in interest rates that could affect small business as well as large? Well, I think, the, listen, the, the possibility, and I'd say probability, I'd say likelihood of higher interest rates at this point is going to be problematic. But if what's driving higher interest rates is a better economy, you know, there's good and there's bad in that, probably in the near term, the shock of higher interest rates will be an immediate negative and the long-term success of the economy will, will be just that, a long-term success. But you have to take uh, both of those things together. I'd say, you no, know, I've been critical of some aspects of things that have happened at the, at the national level, but I give credit. I'd say the movement to lower regulation uh, and I'd say that elements of the tax bill that have lowered taxes for people who are in this group that, of our small business group, you know, things like the pass-through, immediate depreciation of certain assets have been, uh, have been uh, very helpful. On the red tape, again, on the regulatory side, um, a lot of the burdens in the, among the people here, some of it occur at the national level, but a lot of, more of it occur, probably occur at the local level, and also the inconsistency mm -hmm. of red tape which is their word, regulation, my word, uh, that occurs across different rules, licensing requirements from jurisdiction from jurisdiction. So often not varying just by state, but by city, village, town, and it's very complex. I have thousands of people who help me deal with this. If you're a small business, you don't have thousands of people. It all comes out of the time you'd invest in your business. And in the survey that Goldman Sachs did in preparing for this conference, that was a big concern. And in fact, people said they spent as much as a third of their time on compliance, essentially, because they're the compliance officer. That's right. As well That's as right. the CEO, as well That's as the right. CMO just like, CFO. Just like the time you spend, you want to have a simplified tax bill because you don't want to spend more hours on your tax bill than you do in your business, and, and not, not, not in earning the money to pay it but in filling out the form, you know, et cetera. And we kind of know that. And as time goes on, things get more complex. They get layered, layered, layered. And if we're lucky, some, somebody comes along <laughs> and cuts a bit through that wax buildup. So as you say, there can be different reasons for higher interest rates. You say that you yeah. expect them to get higher. As you, because you really have access to a lot of information, as you look at it right now, at the moment, is it more because of an anticipation of growth, as you say, which would be a good thing for increased interest rates, <laughs> as opposed to a concern of really supply and demand for, for bonds? The, the government, the well, Treasury, is going to write more I bonds. think it's both of those and a kind of a related thought is an inflation, which also can reflect supply and demand, but is a separate, you know, separate thing in and of itself. Look, if, if in any other period you saw growth in the United States in the high twos, close to 3 percent, global growth at 4 percent, and I said, quick, tell me, where are, where are interest rates? You wouldn't say short-term interest rates are one and a quarter percent, and you wouldn't say that long-term interest rates are two and three quarters percent. You'd say they were substantially higher. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why interest rates have been low for a long time, and a lot of it has to do with monetary policy, which I don't knock anybody for. I think they've kept us out of a crisis over a long period of time, but it's a delicate balance how to work that back to what I'll call normalcy. Maybe people don't know, maybe people think it's a new normal, but I don't think the new normal is radically different from the old normal. Um, and I think at this time, and, and also I would say policy has affected it, because while we're trying to get away from interest rates that are so low relative to the, to the, to the growth in the economy, uh, we're also trying to undo those memos. So bring rates high, but also don't forget QE. And on top of it, national policy just added to the deficit. Mm -hmm. And so you see, you saw tax, the tax revenues are going to go down. Spending as a result of the new budget deal is going to go up, maybe even more if there's a, uh, if there's a bill for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that has to be funded. So before any of that, you'd have said, gee, that deficit, there's going to be more, there's going to be more bonds that have to be issued. Well, now there'll be even more bonds that have to be issued, and guess what? As the Fed tries to undo its balance sheet, it's also going to sell treasuries into the market, and that's another competitor. And so someone looking at this and saying, hmm, do I want to buy a 10-year treasury, lend money to the United States government, and get 2.8% interest, 2.85% interest? Is that it? 
I may want a little bit more before I give my money. And that's something that's going to happen. And so it's a very logical thing that rates would go up. So as you put that all together, was it worth it? Some of it is growth. Some of it is inflationary expectations. Right. right. Um, and so, you know, it's a combination of things. But we as a country have just bought something for one, $1.5 trillion in the tax cuts, $300 billion over the next two years yep. with the budget. We bought something, some asset. Was it a good trade? Was it a good purchase for us? In, in fact, because as you say, we're going to be issuing more Treasury bills, right? We're going to be more Treasury bonds into the marketplace at a time when the Fed is actually reducing their balance sheet. Uh, is this going to be on net, 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 going to be positive for the country? You know, I'd rather second guess them after I knew what happened. <laughs> uh, and I'd say, I don't know that I would have had the, um, I, it wouldn't have been what I would do. I think it's a very bold thing to kind of throw a little bit more, you know, lighter fluid mm. on a fire that was already going. On, and I'll tell you, I'll take the other side from the administration point of view. They don't believe that the limit of, of greedy GDP growth has been reached, mm -hmm. and they think it'll grow higher. If it does grow higher, people will earn more money. If they earn more money, they'll pay more taxes. That's the whole supply side thing. Could it possibly work? I think it's a risky thing. I probably wouldn't have done it. But a lot of people who had taken that position said the United States co uh, economy is limited to 2%. That was their new normal. Mm -hmm. And here we are several quarters in a row uh, growing close to 3%. So I'd say the jury's out. If you ask me, I'm not trying to back away from it. If you said, would I have done it? Probably not. Do I think crazy? Mm -hmm. No. Wrong, we'll see. But I don't think it's as dangerous. I don't think we're, we're dealing with, uh, I don't think we're dealing with existential risk. You can always change this. You can always cut spending. I mean, it's hard to do from a political point of view, but if a consensus formed that we're getting to a bad place, then you can make adjustments. And also there's monetary policy that's going to, interest rates are going to rise that will slow things down. So you've often said that you, you want to be a contingency planner rather than a forecaster. Well, I find myself, I'd rather be good at forecasting, but yeah. I think yeah. So, so as a being wrong from time to time in my <laughs> forecast, I decided I'd plan for contingencies. Well, we've seen a, a remarkable development in the markets in the last two months, two weeks. Uh, volatility really has spiked up in a way that not too many people anticipated. Uh, is it safe to assume Goldman had planned for that contingency? Were you in good shape <laughs> going into it? I thought you were going to ask. Usually, I get asked, "Did Goldman Sachs cause it? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Did, did we it? plan for it? Of course, we planned for it." I, I listen. I spend ninety-eight percent of my time planning for the 2% mm -hmm. likely things that could go wrong. I mean, that's my job. I'm in the risk management business. But if you ask me what did, of course, statistically, of course, I, I, you know, historically, of course, things don't stay the same. The price of oil is going to stay $60, $60 forever? I don't think so. We're going to have growth in the United States and have interest rates be you know, under 2%, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, the equity market is going to keep going up forever on a measured way and never retreat more than, you know, more than 4 or 5% in a year. I don't think so. We're not that lucky. I'm not that lucky and you're alive at the same time as me. So there's no way it's going to be that way in our lifetime right. because I couldn't be that lucky. And so things are going to happen. There'll be something that happens in the world. Someone will get elected that shouldn't happen. There'll be a natural disaster. A company will go under. There'll be a cyber event. There'll be war, pestilence. Something will happen that will cause all the relationships of one asset to another to have to readjust against each other. It has been an unusual period where that hasn't happened. Now, people aren't sure what the reason why is. My own best guess is when they write dissertations right. down the road and they look back, they'll say at a point of time because of QE and central banks around the world buying risky assets, as much as they could get, almost as fast as debt was issued, they bought them. That tends to be a little blanket mm -hmm. over spikes mm -hmm. in asset prices, and that probably kept things low. As the market and people anticipate that coming off, I think we're going to see more volatility. So if Goldman was planning for this, you were planning for this, it's your job. Not planning mean, for it, well, planning for okay. a contingency yes. that you were planning for, okay. the possibility of. Is it fair to infer then that Goldman is doing pretty well right now, particularly in its trading, in its FIC trading, and commodities, and fixed income, given what's happened with volatility? Because we heard for quite a few quarters from Goldman and others, the problem with trading really was a lack of volatility. This is a much better environment, even if this is a much better environment. Look, we sell insurance to people. We take risk away from each other. If there hasn't been a hurricane on the East Coast for years, 
people stop buying insurance and those that buy insurance don't want to pay a lot. Mm -hmm. If you have four hurricanes, like the year of Katrina, the next year everybody buys insurance and they pay whatever you ask them to pay. Not that the risks have changed that much because anything can happen anytime, but their sentiment has changed and their anxiety has changed. And so it's a much better environment for our client, uh, for our client franchise. And the answer is it is a better environment. At any given day, we could be positioned wrong. You know, we have to position inventory best, uh, based on our best guess as to what our clients will want the next day or the next week or the next month because we deal in illiquidity. Um, so it may not work right every day, but the environment is good for us. It gives us a lot of chances. It makes us valuable to our clients. So for those of us who really are not traders, don't understand trading, give me a sense. As you look at that better environment, as you call it, does it distribute evenly across commodities, across fixed income, across FX? Or do some things get benefited more from this volatile things environment? Things go disproportionately. But when prices of anything change, it's like the butterfly effect. Yeah. When anything changes, the relationship of everything else has to change with it. Mm -hmm. Just think what happened when housing prices went up. Everybody thought, gee, that must be limited to real estate. Mm -hmm. But people borrowed against their real estate. Mm -hmm. So people who borrowed against real estate suffered a wealth reversal. They had to sell assets that weren't, you know, knock on effect, knock on effect, knock on effect. If interest rates go up, the value of things very often is the cash flow. Well, that gets discounted by an interest rate. If interest rates go up, the value of assets go down. Not just bonds, but real estate prices, other prices. If you think right. that solid and stable real estate prices was the predicate for so much va value in the world, could you right. imagine what interest rates are? <laughs> I think a lot of prices will undoubtedly have to reset against each other.